morning. It was so good to hear Jacinda sharing and praying for the needs in our city as we were worshiping. And I've been thinking a lot about the city that we live in. And in my own prayer times, I've been asking the Lord to show me his heart for our city. You know, sometimes I wonder if I could just text message God and he would respond back to me. I would wanna know, God, what is your heart for, for my city? What are you saying uh, about Medicine Hat right now? What are you saying about, uh, uh, is there any hope for our city? Uh, what, 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 what do the next few years look like? Uh, in the early 1900s, R- Rudyard Kipling was asked what he thought about Medicine Hat. He said that we have all hell for a basement. And uh, what if we ask God, God, what do you think about our city? I think the first part of the answer to that question starts with John 3.16, and we talked a little bit about this last week. John 3.16 says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So God's heart for our city and for this world is this. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, he gave his life for us, He died for our sins, he suffered for us, he took the punishment that we deserve so that we could be brought back to God. And then John says, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus did not come to judge the world, Jesus came to save the world. And the very nature of God is love. The apostle John said, we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. And then John goes on to make the most outstanding statement about God. Uh, God is love. The Hebrew word, Hebrews had a word for God's love. It was the word hesed. Uh, some have called this word untranslatable. My Hebrew prof described it as the glue that holds relationships together. Most translations render it as steadfast love or unfailing love. God's steadfast love is found all throughout the Bible. God's unfailing love is found in in this verse where David says, surely your goodness and your unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Those two words, goodness and unfailing love, they are the number one and number two words used about God throughout the entire Bible used to describe God, the number one and number two words to use to describe God. If you were to remove God's love from the pages of the Bible, if you were to remove God's love from Christianity, then you would have just another religion, just another set of rules and rituals. You would have legalism. You would have endless expectations of do this and do that. You would have a cold and bland and religious set of rules and rituals. You would have people who were bitter and mean. And I would argue that where you find people who are bitter and mean, even if they call themselves Christians, you will find people who are still desperately in need of understanding God's love. They still haven't found God's love. What sets Christianity apart from every other major religion of the world is that God has revealed himself over and over again as a loving God, as a personal God who can be known. He's a loving and gracious God, God who cares for you. And he is for you in every possible way that he can be for you. When the Bible seeks to speak about God, it uses the warmest, the most engaging, the most involving, the most powerful metaphor in the human experience, the metaphor of love. And I think for most people who believe in God, they get this, they have come to understand that God is love, but there's a big difference between God's love and God's acceptance. I had a friend in college, his big complaint about God was not that God loved him, he knew that God loved him, he knew that if there was a God, that God must have a loving nature, but a big complaint that was that he didn't believe that God could accept him because of some of the things that he had done in his life. And this is true for so many people. Most people who believe in God believe that God loves them, but many struggle to believe that God forgives them, that God accepts them. And I wanna talk this morning about God's embrace and God's acceptance of us. How do we get God's acceptance? How do we live in God's acceptance? How do we help our neighbor to understand and receive God's acceptance? Because here's what I believe very deeply. If you took all of us Uh, here in this room, you know, one church, three services, and you added it to all of the other churches in the city, we would have a few thousand people. 
And if we all learn to understand God's acceptance for us, that would make a big difference in our lives, in how we parent our children, how we lead our businesses, how we interact with people. If we figured out how powerful God's love is for us, it would change our lives. But we are just a few thousand people. And sure, that would be good for us, but what about the city? We aren't gonna see spiritual change in our city, real change, unless we figure out how to help our neighbors understand God's love and acceptance of them. So how can, so we can get it, but if we can't help our neighbors get it, then we won't see the spiritual change that we need to see in our city. So I wanna do some teaching on the story of the prodigal son, and then I wanna look at this story through the lens of our neighbor. What does this story of the prodigal son tell us about how we can help God to spiritually change our city? And the prodigal son story is a story about God's acceptance of us. It's found in Luke chapter 15. Jesus tells the story of a man who had two boys and one of his sons wants to live in the fast lane. He's searching for the meaning of life and he decides that the only way he can find uh, this is to leave his home and leave his family and head off to another city. So he asks his father for his inheritance. His father grieves the loss of the son. He's sad to leave him go, but he gives him his inheritance. Soon the son is off to another city. He's living large. He has all kinds of money. He makes friends easily, and he is just living the life. And he's discovered the meaning of life is pleasure. And he's pretty sure that he's living the best life possible. But the son doesn't get a job. He doesn't invest the money anywhere. He blows it in a short amount of time. And pretty soon he has spent all of his money. So his so-called friends leave him. And the only work that he can get is a desperate job taking care of some pigs and eating what the pigs eat. And he reaches this desperate place in his life and he discovers that what he really wants is not pleasure, but what he really wants is to be loved. And he starts to think about his family and he starts to think about his father and his brother. And here he is all alone and he discovers that what he really wants is to be loved. So here's the son sitting there and he's in this pig pen, working with the pigs, eating with the pigs, and he misses his father's love. He misses his family. He tries to pursue happiness, but now he finds out he really, really ultimately needs love and acceptance. Finally decides to come home. He works out a plan. He's gonna beg for his father's forgiveness, for his rebellion, for his foolishness, for his immaturity. He's afraid that his father won't accept him as a son anymore. He's afraid that his father is gonna want nothing to do with him, so he plans to ask just to work as a stable hand. He just wants to be home. Now his father has been watching for his son's return every single day. He's been sitting on his front porch and he spots his son walking far off in the distance and he begins to run to his son. Now this is unheard of in the ancient world for the father of a household like that to run like that, but he runs and the son mutters his prepared apology, but the dad just wraps his arms around the son and gives him this incredible embrace and welcomes him home and kisses him and orders that they start a party to celebrate that his son has arrived and that his son is home. And, and this son that, that he had feared was dead is now alive and has come back home. And this parable teaches us something about God's embrace because Jesus, the father, uh, for, for Jesus, the father in the story represents God and the son in the, rep, in the story represents all of us all of us who are lost or have been lost at some point in time and far from God. And this parable shows us God is ready to embrace you. Verse 20 says, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. The father probably spent every spare moment that he had looking down that road, hoping to see his son return. Like any lovesick father, he longed for his son to return. And if you've ever had a son or a daughter move from the city that you live in to another place for work or for college, then you know that sick feeling that you get when you remember that they're not with you. They are far away and they're often in your thoughts and, and they're always in your prayers. But you know that in one month or three months or six months that you're gonna see them again but it's hard and painful and our heavenly father feels the same kind of loss when we are far from him. Uh, yet even when we are far from God, 
You are never far from his mind. He is thinking about you. He is with you even when you don't know it or recognize it. His thoughts are always on you. His attention is always towards you. He delights in you so much that each and every moment he longs for your return. He misses you and he longs to be in relationship with you. And it was his love that caused him to create you because he wanted to have a relationship with you. And God doesn't make junk and God created you with love. And when you are far from him, he longs to talk to you and be with you so that you can experience that relationship you were created for. If God likes you, who cares what anyone else thinks of you? If God accepts you and delights in you, then you don't have to prove yourself to anybody. And so this parable shows us that God is ready to embrace you. But even more than that, God is ready to embrace you in spite of your sin. This was the big problem that my friend had with God. Yeah, you know, I know that God loves me, but will God accept me? And in the story that Jesus told, his son said to him, and this is that speech that the son had prepared for his father. He says, Father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. So what was the big sin that the son had done? Well, the son asking his father for his inheritance is a huge insult. In those days, it was the son saying, I am eager for you to die or I wanna live like you are dead. That's hurtful when you think about it. The father would have had to sell off a large portion of his estate in order to meet his son's request. This means that his income is gonna drop by half, and his son has effectively diminished the family's income and resources by half. The son has damaged the father financially. The whole community would have gathered at an auction sale and found out why the father was selling all of his possessions. They, they would have found out about the son's rebellion and, and that, that would have brought a lot of shame upon the father. Most fathers was, would disown their sons and just send them away if they'd made this request. But through this parable, Jesus says that God's love never ends. He's the everlasting father. His love is eternal. God does not step in all the time and save us from the consequences of our decisions. Often he lets us live through the consequences so that we can grow. And God grieves for us because he knows that the consequences of sin are gonna be tough for us, that there's gonna be a difficult road ahead. But God's love does not end for us when we wander off and go our own way. God consistently waits for us and is there to help us when we return. Jeremiah 13 verse, 31 verse three says, God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Psalm 89 two, God's love will last for all time. Even when we offend him, when we hurt him, when we sin against him, he loves us, he pursues us because God's love is not a human love. Human love has a tendency to, to grow cold and to wear out and to grow hard. You know, we're nice to those who love us. We're, we're mean to those who don't love us. That's human nature. But God's love is different. God chooses to love you even when you don't deserve it. God chooses to love you even when you are far from him. Have you ever lost some money? One time I lost a $50 bill. Uh, this was back in college. I drove a VW Rabbit, a uh, small little car. Uh, I don't know how I fit into that thing, but uh, I lost 50 bucks in there somewhere. My car was a bit of a mess. Uh, like there was Cheetos under the seat. There was old licorice and sweaty socks from basketball practice. And um, they kind of dropped out of my gym bag and we're just sitting there growing mold on them, you know, that kind of stuff. So about two years after I lost this $50 bill, I decided, you know, maybe I should clean my car. You know, it's been a few years. I should clean my car. It was in bad shape, sticky, uh, you know, I, so I found this, this $50 bill and, and as I was cleaning my car and it was sticky, it was discolored, it was torn, it was beat up. And, I, and guess what I did? I, I went to the bank and I put it in my account because the value of that $50 bill had not changed, even though it had been beaten up and messed up and lost for two years. And God chooses to love you even when you don't deserve it. God chooses to love you even when you are far from him. If you've made mistakes, if you've blown it, you still have value to God. You are still worth something to him. Just like that $50, you are loved by God, not because you're squeaky clean and perfect, 
but because you're made in his image. You matter to him big time. Yes, our sin damages us. Our sin grieves God. We're still precious to him, though. We're still valued by him. God's love never ends. The third thing we learn from this parable is that God's embrace will protect you. Notice in the story, the father says something interesting right away. He says to his servants, quick, bring uh, the finest robe of the house, put it on him, get a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet. Now he actually says this for the son's protection. Let me show you what I mean by that. The son comes home, he's ready with his prepared speech. The son comes home repentant, which is really important. He comes home with a new appreciation for his father and for his family. But the father ran to him, threw his arms around his son and kissed him. And this is an embarrassing thing to do for a father. In Jesus' day, only a mother would be able to get away with doing this. If a father did this, it would be considered unmanly and humiliating. The father was willing to make a fool of himself to do this. It was his love for him. And, and he's not looking out for himself. He's, he doesn't care about himself. He only cares about his son. And he has his son's interest at heart, but it was also to pr- protect his son. You see, when a son shamed his father like this, he was cut off from his community and from, it, from his family and also from the entire community. And if his son had the guts to return, he would be jeered, he would be insulted, he would be roughed up by some of the tough guys in town. They would have said, get out of town. Don't bring any more shame on your father. Don't bring any more shame on your community. And the father knew that, so he ran to the son and he embraced him in order to protect him. That was a sign that the father was being fully protective. The father was restoring his sonship and his identity so that the son could be protected. He says, get the robe, get the ring, get the sandals. Those are all signs of sonship. Those are marks that he's the father's son so that anyone who sees the son walking around town knows not to beat him up but they can see by the robe, by the ring, by the sandals that the son has his father's protection. The son has been restored to his father's favor. So God's embrace protects you. God's embrace also brings you back to life. The father goes on to say, and and kill the, the, the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. The father doesn't wait for the son to come crawling to him. He runs to his son. He asks a servant to bring a new robe, bring a ring, bring sandals. All those are signs that he's restoring the son. He doesn't give his son a lecture. You know, I hope you learned your lesson this time. He doesn't give him any threats. You know, just wait until your mother gets home. Just imagine what she's gonna say. No penalty to pay. Jesus describes the love of the father that shouts out, This is my son who was lost and now is found. And God's love for us is no different. When, like that lost son, we have a change of heart and when we humble ourselves and when we come running back to our heavenly father, he runs to us and he restores us and he brings us back to life. I don't know if you've ever experienced the agony of losing something and then the joy of finding what you lost, but you get just a glimpse in that moment of how God feels when we humble ourselves. And when we come back to him, finally God's embrace challenges our understanding of grace. As we watch how the family responds, we learn that we can only understand God's love when we've experienced God's grace. The older brother refuses to go to the party. He's angry uh, at at his father. He's angry at his brother. He just doesn't get it. How could his dad embrace his brother after all that he's done? And his father says to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now is found. And here the older brother, he's been a good son. He's followed the rules. He's never shamed his father. He's never hurt the father financially, yet the younger brother does all of that. And yet he gets all of the glory. He gets this hero's welcome. And the older brother is so angry at all of that. But this shows us that we don't like grace. Grace seems unfair to us. Yet in reality, grace is perfectly fair because whether we realize it or not, we all need grace. And the younger son experienced the father's grace in his life. He realizes that there's not a better place to be than that place of humility and rest before God. That's the place where God wants all of us to live, where the younger son ended up 
you can be sure that the younger son was a grace-filled person because he has experienced the grace of the father himself. The older brother, he actually hasn't really experienced grace because he's been pretty good. He's not really had a need for grace. And so he ends up angry because he's never needed grace. He doesn't understand it. And the reality is that we all need grace for we all have sinned and we've all fallen short of God's glory. We all have a need for grace, but our ability to receive grace is hindered if we believe that we have not done anything wrong, if we refuse to admit that we've never sinned. If we're self-righteous, then we are far from God's grace. As long as we think that we are doing pretty good on our own and we don't need God's grace, then we are really far from the heart of God. The Pharisees who were listening to the story, they, they were self-righteous. They were proud of how good they were. They, they did all the right things, but the self-righteousness prevents us from humbling ourselves and receiving God's grace. And sadly, it also prevents us from giving God's grace to others and, and rejoicing with other people when they receive God's grace. The reason so many Christians live in a continual state of guilt and the reason some Christians are unhappy and miserable and mean is that they are convinced that God is upset with them and they are trusting more in their own performance than in God's grace. We know that we're on the path of the older brother when we cannot extend grace to other people, when we have a hard time letting go of hurt, when we're critical to others for their sin or their faults, when we shun others, when we find ourselves angry or grumbling or complaining, when we envy other people's success, when we find ourselves competing to have the greatest company or the greatest salary to feel valuable. All of this reveals that we do not understand God's love for us and we do not understand God's grace towards us and we don't understand our identity in Christ because we're still trusting more in our ability than in God's ability. It's a path that leads to despair and guilt and anger and resentment. But listen to this, God won't love you more than he does right now. And God will never love you less than he does right now. God does not approve of sin, he doesn't. Yet somehow God has the ability to love and care for those who sin. You know, if I had to wait for God's approval, until I had it all together, then I would never get it. And the point of the story is not that the son went out and rebelled, but that the son was aware of his state and the older brother was not aware of his state. That's the crucial difference between the prodigal son and the older brother. You don't have to go out and rebel and live life uh, apart from God in order to receive God's grace. You only need to humble yourself and trust in God's love to save you whether your sins are large or small, we are acceptable and righteous to God, not on the basis of what we do or don't do, but on the basis of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. God took my sins and he placed it on Jesus, which is why Jesus died on the cross. He, he took Jesus' perfect righteousness and he placed it on me. And there was an exchange that took place. And it, this, an amazing exchange. God made Jesus who had no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. This was given to us as a gift and I don't work for it. You don't work for it. We don't deserve it. But like any gift, we need to receive it. We need to accept it. We need to grab onto it and hold onto it and live into it. At no time is God's love and acceptance of me ever in question. Even though we stumble and fall and maybe give into temptation and make some mistakes and need to ask for forgiveness, God's love is never in question. Okay, so that's the basic theology that we draw from Jesus' story about the prodigal son. But I wanna look for a moment and get us to think about what does this look like for us to embrace our neighbors if we were to take the attitude and posture of God that we see in the story of the prodigal son, how would that affect our attitude towards our neighbors? You see, in this story, God is showing who he is. God is showing us how he forgives and how he shows grace to us. But he's also modeling for us how to treat our neighbor. And if we were to take this teaching on the prodigal son and apply it to our neighbor, then we would stand ready to embrace our neighbors. 
The idea is that it, it, we're all like this prodigal. At some point in time, we all strayed and wandered away from God. And just as God has embraced all of us, God wants us to embrace other people. And to do that, God is looking for help. If we had the, the, the posture of God towards our neighbors, we would embrace our neighbors, we would offer to our neighbor the same acceptance that God has given to us. And this is a radical idea, this is a radical concept that God would embrace us, that God is showing us how he loves people and God is challenging us to also love people in the same way. You think about someone in your life that you struggle to love, that you struggle to accept, uh, a neighbor, a coworker, maybe an extended family member, and you've tried to accept them, but it's just so hard, but you're kind of stuck with them because they live beside you, they work with you, they're, they're in your extended family, you're kind of stuck with them. Are you ready to embrace that person, to show your acceptance, your love for that person? And that's a good question. But even beyond that, if we took the posture of God towards our neighbor, we would be ready to embrace our neighbor in spite of their faults. Okay, so that goes even one step further. This is not just, uh, well, I struggle to accept you for some reason I don't like you. It's you've actually done something to harm me, something that hurt me, something that embarrassed me. Are you ready to embrace your neighbor, your friend, your coworker, your family member in spite of their faults? Remember the father starts running towards the son before he even knows about the apology, right? His attitude is to embrace the son despite how much the son has shamed him or hurt him. And if we took on the attitude of God, we'd be protecting, protective and caring towards our neighbors. Sometimes we get competitive, sometimes we get distrustful towards some of the people we struggle to love, but what would it look like to be protective of your neighbor? What would it look like to be caring and protective towards that coworker, that, that family member that you struggle to love? And we would be ready to help our neighbors find new life in Jesus. The father says, my son has come home, he was dead, now he's alive, and it's this imagery of new life that we find in Christ. That's the father's attitude. That's the father's posture in the story. I want to help my son who is lost to find life. Do we have that same attitude towards our neighbor? Do we really want to help them to find life in Jesus? Do we really want to have the, them to have the same life that we have, the same love of God that we enjoy, the same acceptance from God that we enjoy? Or do we want to keep this good news to ourselves? Do we wanna say, oh, it's, it's good enough that there's a few thousand people in our city that know this. So why should I care if my neighbor knows this or not? No, we don't want that. We want our city to be spiritually changed. We want our city to know the love and the acceptance of God in their lives. So where can we start? Well, I wanna give you some practical steps that you can take, things that can help you to start to embrace your neighbors, to be protective and caring towards your neighbors, and over the course of time to find opportunities to help your neighbors to find new life in Jesus. First step is this, connection. It all starts with connection. So often, we drive into our garage door, we shut the garage door, we go into our house, we come out to the garage door, we are into the garage, and we drive out, and, and we miss opportunities to connect with our neighbors. We got a great story to share with you. This is so good. This is how one family in our church found a way to connect with their neighbors. And it all started because connecting with neighbors was on the heart of their little girl. Let's take a look at this. What'd you do for your birthday? What did you ask your parents for? Did you ask for Lego? No. What'd you ask for? Uh, a bouncy house. A bouncy house just for you? For all of the people. What people? Mm -hmm, my cul-de-sac. Your cul-de-sac? Like your neighbors? Mm -hmm. So wait, you, you wanted something for your birthday. What did you ask for? A bouncy house. We asked Victoria what she wanted to do for her fifth birthday. And uh, she just all of a sudden said, like, I, want, I miss my neighbors and I want to hang out with them. So we had talked about doing like a cul-de-sac party 
for years, but it just never quite happened. And then we were like, you know what, this is maybe the opportunity for that with with like life stuck behind doors and things that are changed and winter happened and we hadn't seen the neighbors we usually see. So she just decided that for her birthday, instead of having like the preschool friends and doing the thing that we normally would do or doing family activities, that we would just invite the whole cul-de-sac, which turned into a big event. It was actually a lot of fun. We bought about 120 hot dogs, invited the cul-de-sac, invited the neighbors like, over on the next cul-de-sac, ones across the street. Next thing you know, we had 45 people and we just decided, why not? Why not have you know the cul-de-sac together, the community brought together because Victoria, that's all she really wanted was an opportunity to see the people in our cul-de-sac kind of hang out together because she just missed them. Sometimes I'm the one that wants to just stay inside a little bit, have a coffee and watch out the window, but she's the one it's like come on out watch me let's hang out together and so next thing you know I go out there and she has a couple of friends down the street that came over to visit and she's that kid she goes over and um, makes really great relationships with the people around us and she's not shy about going over there and hanging out and especially now that she knows these people she's just confident and kind of going and knocking and hanging out she decided one day um, she it was at the the um, Tim Hortons like the smile cookie week and so we said do you want to buy a smile cookie for anybody I and mean, she's like yeah I want to buy it for and then she started naming off all of our neighbors I'm like okay so we bought like a pack of smile cookies and she knocked on the neighbors doors and she just handed them a cookie so instead of being the one to knock to ask for the fundraiser you know that we all have to be a part of when, when it comes to kids this time it was to give back and it was just here's a cookie here you go have a smile today and it it just was one of those opportunities that we didn't expect, right? To, to, to have those relationships with people that we didn't realize we would. So, yeah, she's definitely taught me a lot. <laughs> Isn't that the way it works? Sometimes our, our kids kind of get us and push us out of our comfort zone and help us to make connections with our neighbors. So here's what I want to encourage us to do. Uh, here's a few ideas one, one, uh, on ways to build connections in your neighborhood. Uh, and, and what we're planning to do is in the fall, we want to actually make a push where, where we're going to do something called a, a community that cares. And the last two weeks of August and all through the month of September, we want to be doing good deeds and acts of kindness for our neighbors. So kind of to prepare for that and to lead up to that all through the summer, I want to encourage you to stop at lemonade stands. Stop at lemonade stands and, and often the parents are kind of helping with that. And it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to not only bless your neighbors and bless your community, but also to get to know people and to get to know maybe what their needs are. Stop at garage sales. Some of you, this is no problem. You love garage sales already, but some of you are like, no, no, I don't, don't want to buy anything. But you don't have to buy anything. You can go in and just, and just talk to your neighbor. One of the ways that I got to know uh, a neighbor of mine was through a garage sale that he had. And they were kind of uh, busy people and, and not off and around and out and about like some of us are. And, and so I got to know him and had a great conversation with him at his garage sale. Uh, mow the extra mile. Uh, so you maybe have a neighbor who's maybe struggling a little bit physically or going through, uh, you know, something or just getting a little bit older and, and, uh, maybe you can offer to help them with the lawn, uh, take the conversation beyond the fence to uh, take that conversation to, Hey, Hey, do you want to do coffee? Do you want to just sit here and, and, and have a coffee and just talk about life? Uh, so it all starts with connection. Second step to embracing your neighbors is caring for their needs. As you stop at lemonade stands and garage sales and all that kind of stuff, pay attention to what your neighbors might need. Maybe they have a need that you can meet and, and then meet that need. Now, you can't meet all of the needs that your neighbors have, but maybe they have a need that you can meet and look for a way that you can meet that need. Third step is to pray for opportunities to share about Jesus, because ultimately that is, um, the goal is to do good deeds and love people, but ultimately we want people to know who Jesus is and what he has done for us on the cross, because that, that ultimately is the way that we know God accepts us, is because we have repented of our sins and we've turned to God and God has forgiven us because of what Christ has done. So pray for opportunities to share about Jesus and start talking about Jesus. And then remember, we don't have to be good enough 
to start this. We don't have to be good enough to start this. God can use you. God's spirit is in you. God's presence is with you. And God can use you to start this process and to bless your neighbors, not just with a practical need, but also ultimately with an eternal need and a spiritual need. And so Father, I pray for our church, Lord. I pray for our community. I pray for our city. As we come out of COVID and we're kind of, you know, just um, like a deer in headlights sometimes with all the changes that are happening and the increase of prices and costs and the different great challenges that are coming and, the, and the, you know, in terms of, for some of us, great things are happening, good things are happening. And for some of us, hard things are happening and we're going through so much. And yet, God, you were there with us. And I pray, Lord, in the midst of all that we're facing, we would not uh, become introspective, that we would not just look at ourselves and our own needs. I pray, Lord God, that you would widen our vision, that you'd widen our perspective, that you would help us to see the value of loving our neighbors and embracing our neighbors and helping our neighbors to come to learn and know and experience the love and acceptance of God that we have come to know. And so I pray in the name of Jesus that we would see as we head into next year, that Lord God, we would just see seats filled in this room, in all of our services, of people that are hungry to know you and longing to know you and hungry to return to you and longing to return to you. And so I pray, oh Lord God, that you would do an incredible work in our city, that you would do a changing work in our city. And I really believe that that's coming, Lord. I believe that that's coming. You are preparing the churches of this city to receive an outpouring of your grace that's gonna come in our city and in the lives of our people. Lord, help us to be faithful, to be a part of that. We ask this in Jesus' name. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you his perfect peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Have a fantastic day and be blessed. We'll see you again next Sunday.